I'm Natalie Birchfield, and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Bond BB. In the next hour, our experts are going to share with you some practical and relevant information on how your family business can effectively manage leadership transitions and plan successfully for your exit. Before we get started, I wanted to cover some brief logistical items. If you have any questions as we go along, please use the question function on the GoToWebinar toolbar that should be on the right side of your screen. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. You can also use this toolbar to let us know about any technical difficulties you may be having, and we will try to correct those as soon as possible. Also, if you have any colleagues who are unable to participate today, we will be posting the presentation on our website in the next few days at bbcpa.com slash webinar. Now, on to our presenters. Joining us today is Jeffrey Brown, a partner at Bond BB and leader of our firm's Family Business Advisory Group. He has over 30 years of accounting experience and specializes in providing accounting and business services to family-owned enterprises. Also sharing insights today is Ed Davis of Harvest Business Advisors, a certified public accountant with a special designation of certified valuation analyst who has been involved in business sales, acquisitions, and business valuations for over 15 years. And now, without any further remarks, I'll turn the presentation over to Jeff. Okay, thanks very much. And um, let me first start by saying that just because Ed's only been doing that for 15 years doesn't mean that he's younger than I am. Um, <laughs> might as well start off with a, a little humor. Yeah. Um, the first thing that we want to do, though, is both of us want to apologize to everybody that's listening that uh, we happen to be doing this during the USA-Germany World Cup game, um, and we promise that we'll get you back to that game for the second half, which will be the more exciting part of it anyhow. And uh, Ed is wearing his USA uh, shirt, right? My official jersey. Yeah, absolutely. So we're there too in spirit if we're not there you know in front of the TV so I apologize for that we'll get you to the game as soon as we can so um, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what some of the things are that uh, family businesses need to do and to look at um, when um, exiting the business and exiting the business does not necessarily simply mean selling the business um, so let's talk a little bit first about um, what some of the options are when you um, are have a family business and you may or may not, um, or you're at a point where you want to you want to kind of move on uh, if you're the the older generation. So obviously one of them is passing on to the next generation, which we'll talk about some more. And uh, then, uh, another one is selling the business, um, and also thirdly closing up shop. And um, it might be surprising to some of you to see that uh, on the list, but the reality is that there are many businesses, not just family businesses, who uh, uh, end up uh, just deciding to close their doors. Um, and I'm sure Ed has examples of those, and I can certainly give you examples of those. So um, let's talk a little bit about passing on to the next generation first. Um, everybody might think that that's, uh, uh, I don't want to say a relatively simple thing. Uh, it's never a simple thing, but it, it might not necessarily um, be something where you're concerned about value um, and what is being passed on and what that means. Uh, however, um, if you're really thinking about it and planning about it, you do want to know um, the value of your business and what it is that you're passing on. That may come into play in terms of how it all works relative to other family members. So, Ed, let's talk about that a little bit first. Um, <clears throat> when you're in this in this position where you're 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 you've come to the realization that, that it's time for you to get out of the business and let your your kids take over, um, what are some of the things that that, that person, uh, as the as the patriarch or matriarch, ought to ought to be considering or thinking about um, from the value standpoint um, of the business? Uh, any thoughts there? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, <clears throat> We have the world that we work in are privately owned small businesses, and just as a as a definition, those tend, tend to be businesses with revenues, you know, that are less than twenty million dollars. They have anywhere from five to fifteen, maybe twenty five employees. So that's the market we work in. We don't work in public markets; we work in private markets. Mm -hmm. So when we get a call, if we're introduced to a um, privately owned uh, business owner who's now thinking about what to do and how to pass on to generation two, what we will typically find, and 
probably 80% of the time is that they haven't thought about it until that day, that week. They haven't really thought how they're going to do it, what the plans are going to be. It's all been sort of done informally up to this point, and at, at a point right now where they're looking at trying to formalize this process, they really don't have an idea of what the value of their company is and how they're going to do it. So we're really starting kind of with a clean slate. And what kind of complicates the issues with, with family transfers is really this, and forget about estate and, and valuations that relate to estate planning or gift tax planning. We're, we're really talking about a, a generation where you, Jeff, as the owner of your company, want to monetize this asset and take some money off the table and retire and go do some things that you want to do in some fashion. So we're, we're not talking about gifting, we're talking about a real transaction. What complicates this in the world of family businesses is not only have they not thought about it, but there's stuff on the table. Um, you know, the, the son, the daughter, the, the relative has been working with the person for a bit. There's a relationship there. It could be good. It could be bad. It might be sideways. So probably half the time that we spend initially with a owner of a company that's looking at doing this kind of a, a transfer has nothing to do with evaluation. It has to do with understanding what the real motivations are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm sure that there, when you're dealing with, with family members, there are a lot of things to consider um, that don't necessarily come into play um, in the um, non-family Right, sector. third party unrelated kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we, we, we want to talk about in a little bit um, is um, some of the things that they might do from a planning perspective. But first, let's talk a little bit about um, the value, valuing the business and the valuation and um, you know what the business owner hopes to get out of that um, presumably you know they're going to have their as you say their needs they, can, they might want to go to Florida or, or whom, wherever and retire um, uh, so the valuation is an important piece in terms of making sure that there's something fair it, it, even between family members uh, fairness can be a uh, something that, that is important to consider. Totally agree. The, um, I should say that when we are working with a, a transfer from generation one to generation two, we need to establish what our, our role is, uh, what kind of um, position we want to take. And, and in the world of doing uh, evaluations and transactions, there really are two different areas that you can practice in. You can be an advisor similar to what you do with your clients when you're advising them on tax and transitions. Um, that's the role that we take in a situation where we're working with a family that's going from generation to generation one to generation two. We are uh, an advisor as opposed to an advocate, mm -hmm. which is a role that we would take if we were actually trying to monetize this with an unrelated third party person or, or investor. So it's clear we want to be real clear with both parties that we don't have any you know, dog in the fight here, that we really are neutral. So when we get into, once we get past the non-financial related issues or the non-valuation related issues, and then we can start talking about valuation, really what we're doing is approaching them in an advisory capacity and saying, uh, the term you used is spot on, it was fair value. And that's, that's a phrase that's used throughout the valuation process, meaning as it's defined by the IRS, there's a willing parties to the deal, a willing seller, a willing buyer. They're not bound. They have no obligation. They know all the information, and they're capable and able to do the transaction. That's where we start, fair value. So our role at that point, even as the advisor, is to go through, assemble the information, do the analysis, do the critiques, come back to them with typically a draft and says, all right, folks, this is what we've looked at. This is the information that we've been provided. On the basis of this and on the basis of our analytical research, your value is going to be between A and B, okay? And that's fair value. At that point, it depends on what the parties want to do, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I've seen occasions where owner number one, generation number one, has wanted to monetize 100% of the fair value. Um, feeling that's the right thing to do. It was their sweat equity and they want to be paid in full because even though generation number two has been working in the business and helping build some of that equity, they were fairly compensated and paid along the way. Mm -hmm. sure. On the other hand, I've seen cases where generation number one, understanding what that value may be, um, has a different perspective 
and they do realize that the only reason it is worth a million dollars or whatever that number is is because generation number two has been there helping, supporting, doing all the things in the background to get this to, to that value. So then we start talking about appropriate discount off that mm -hmm. fair value. But the key is fair value, and, and that's, that's the right starting point. Yeah, yeah, certainly. One of the other things that you mentioned, too, initially was um, that they oftentimes come to you, come to you um, um, when they, the day they've decided, the week they've decided, the month they've decided that this is what they want to do, which um, uh, leads me to, to believe that, that, that they really haven't talked that much about it with anybody up to that point in time. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little later on um, in terms of who the other people are that they may want to engage and talk to and you know, what other needs are there. Certainly, uh, you know, an attorney and from, you know, drawing up documents, et cetera. But we, we can get to that a, a little bit later on. Okay. So, but, but also along that same line is, is you know, they, they decided um, yesterday that they wanted to sell the business. So they called you and you're meeting with them today. <laughs> and, and, you know, the reality is that that's probably that, that their timing is, is, is not as good as it should have been. That this is something they should have been thinking about five, ten years ago. Right. Right. Yeah, when we, uh, when we have that kind of opportunity, when we have that kind of an engagement and we're sitting at a table and we're having that discussion and the owner says, part of our interview process is why now? What's the motivation? What are we talking about? And um, what's the timing of this transaction? When do you want to do this? And if they say Monday, mm -hmm. then there's the flag. Something is wrong. Something is terribly, terribly wrong. We all know that practically this is a year-long process. So if, the, if the timing is Monday, that means they've had a bad year, a bad week, a bad day. Something else is in the, in the works that's influencing them other than these impartial advisors. So we have to figure that out. We've got to understand if they're just really motivated or if it's just a bad day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's making them have a bad day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about you know, some of the factors that are involved. And um, there, there are two showing up on the screen, and, and only two, uh, because um, I thought that these were a couple of things that were really relevant relative to the uh, Because oftentimes what happens is um, you might have, uh, you know, a, a, a person who's built this business up, and from day one when they first started it, they have um, assumed that their kids were going to come in and take over the business. Um, they had assumption, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so when they when they get to that point where they're ready to sell, they're, they're, they they come up against one either the ability for them to do that to do that, or two the desire for them to do that. So, um, I'm assuming that you've run into these situations where um, they have this thought in their mind, and as you're looking at it, it's it's painfully obvious. Um, that um, they don't have either the ability or, or well, I shouldn't say either or, they may not have the ability or they may not have the desire um, to do it. And um, part of your job is to, is to end up doing a little counseling uh, with some of these folks. Yeah, a, in the first month when we're talking to a business owner that's looking at a generational transfer, I would say 80% of the time has nothing to do with numbers and valuations uh, at all. It's all about the two things that you've got on your on your PowerPoint here. It's the ability of the, of the next generation to do that, and it's the desire of the next generation to do that. And if it's not 100% of the time, it's really close to me safely telling you that nobody has had that conversation within the family. They really don't know what the abilities yeah. are. It's the great unknown. They don't know what the desires are. I can share with you a story that we had. We were representing, we typically represent um, clients who are what we call sell-side engagement. They, they have a company and they're looking to sell or they're looking to transfer their company. We had a great company we were working with. They were um, in the construction trade related business. Uh, the company had been around for 25 to 30 years. This was a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago. Um, they had 20 to 25 employees, so then they're done that. They had withstood mm -hmm. the test of time. So in the family or in the business, there were three family members who were um, an integral part of the business. There was a production person, 
and then there were two folks who worked with the accounting and the HR and advertising related mm -hmm. issues. So on the 25th year, um, Dad had decided it was time for him to retire. He went out and talked to one of his competitors. They did a transaction, and on Monday, you know, Dad walks back into the office and gladly tells everybody, "I have great news for you. you know, I, I sold the company." <laughs> there was this, the, the room was as quiet as it is right now, and it was the other three looked and said, "You did what?" <laughs> you know, we had no idea. How dare you not think of us, consider us? What do you think we're doing here? Don't you think that we should have been involved in this decision? And Dad's Dad's response was, "I, I had no idea." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me fast forward a little bit. Um, you know, the the emotion settled in. That's always sort of sort of the baggage and the stuff that's on the table with this mm -hmm. thing. So the emotion settled in. And the transaction didn't work the way everybody was hoping it was going to work. So a few years later, Dad had the opportunity to buy the business back. And he exercised the option, and he bought the business back. So he walks back in on Monday morning and has a staff meeting, and the kids are there. And he says, i got great news. I have bought the business back. It is now back to the family-run business. And there was applause and you know happiness and blah, blah, blah. So that was the second milestone. So the third milestone was three or four years later, Dad has the Monday morning operations meeting with the family. And he announces that it's now time for the three siblings, so the three kids, to step up and take over because he was going to go to West Virginia and do his thing. What do you think the reaction was? They probably didn't want to do it at that point. I had no interest in doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest in doing this. We see the turmoil. We see the the stress and you know we're happy doing what we do in our little niches here but you know I don't really want to do this yeah yeah so we we managed to cross all the quarters with one little business in you know, mm -hmm. a matter of about seven years yeah yeah really that, that's that's really interesting um, and and it's obvious that that um, just like in so many other family businesses that we deal with that um, there was there was a lack of communication would you say <laughs> It was no communication. <laughs> okay, well, I'm trying to give a little surprises. credit. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to give a little credit. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, marketability. Um, oftentimes, one of the other things I know you deal with is is that um, you know the business isn't worth what the guy thinks it's worth. You know, everybody has this inflated vision, and, and I can tell you that it, in almost every single instance that I've run into, the the the, the view is that the business is worth 20 million when it's only worth 10 or 5. Um, so you're uh, thinking from the seller standpoint. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Um, so well, and I'm, I deal, I'm dealing mostly with sellers. So uh, you know, how do you deal with that piece? I mean, you know, what's the what's the reality check? How, do they do they even are they even capable of 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 looking at at it realistically? And and if they are, then what do you do with them? Yeah, let me um, let me get to that point and let me sort of add add a little background on that for a moment because when we're talking about marketability and current values, uh, here's a little history. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, when privately owned companies were then going on the market to be sold, there was no market, there was no opportunity. You know, the earlier screen that had the one of the options on there was to close the business. Mm -hmm. You know, I came from a family-owned business environment. That's exactly what happened. You know, my grandfather started the business. My father took the business over, and gave me a call on one weekend and said, "I'm closing up. Come help me." You know, mm -hmm. shut the doors, and that's yeah. exactly what happened. So back in the '80s and '90s, uh, when a business was being transferred to a family owner or was being sold to an unrelated third party, the deal went this way: Jeff, you've got a business. Um, and you want to sell it to me, and I'm very interested in taking it over. And we'll talk about the deal, and we'll structure a deal. And here's how it's going to happen. I'm going to bring a certain amount of cash to the table to pay you, and then you're going to hold a note for the difference. Mm -hmm. That's how the deals were done. Banks weren't doing it. They didn't do cash collateral kinds of loans for business acquisitions. There was no SBA to speak of that was doing a lot of these financing for these transactions. That's how the deals got done. So historically, we run into a situation now where the SBA became a very important part of this process. 
because the ability to do a deal is only based on the ability to do the financing to do mm -hmm. the deal. Right. So the SBA becomes a major player in this market. They're there. They're doing the loans. They're doing the guarantees. They're allowing the banks now to get more involved in this. The banks are now seeing an opportunity where they don't need to do SBA all the time. They can do regular straight commercial loans. So all of a sudden, you know, the, the late 90s are here, and we're seeing this ramp up in values, right? It's like the home mm -hmm. situation. If sure. I can borrow X number of dollars, I can, get, I can pay more for your house, even though it's only worth whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had situations where, because of the, the uh, financing that was available, and it wasn't just available to do the deal or to do the transfer. It was when they went to settlement, you know, here was the million-dollar loan to do in proceeds to pay the seller. And then the second document that was given to the buyer was the application for the credit line for two hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. There wasn't any real stress test on that. It was just part of the transaction. So that was the working capital that they needed to do yeah. you know, to, to stay in business. So we get this ramp up in values, but oddly enough, you know, these values that escalated and were ramping up, uh, do you think the cash flows were actually changing in these businesses? Unlikely. No, they yeah. weren't, right? They were still generating X number of dollars of, of yeah. cash flow. We just could pay them because we had access to credit and capital. Mm -hmm. So on the marketability and the current values, that was where we were at a time. We're sort of back to that now because we went through this you know, Great Depression from 2009 to 10, 11, and 12, and we're working our way out of it. But we really got back to that situation where the sale of a privately owned company, be it generational, or be it third party, was really based on the ability of the seller to still bring their interest, not that they wanted to, to help finance the deal. So mm -hmm. that's where we've been kind of stuck for the last couple of years until maybe a year, year and a half ago where now there is a, a credit window that's, that's mm -hmm. reopening. Mm -hmm. But the current value of a company really has, I mean, we do our, our, our analysis, we do the valuation, but the current value of a company is really based on a couple of things that have nothing to do with value, with a, with a number. And it's based on four things. And this is something we've learned over the last 14 years. It has to do with, are you Jeff, the owner of the company, what's your motivation to do the deal? Whether it's giving it or transact, doing a transaction with your kids or whether it's a third party, what's the motivation? And if you tell me that the only motivation to do this transaction is to monetize it 100% for what you can get, it won't get done. Mm -hmm. So what we've learned in this process is that there's got to be another compelling reason for you to want to do this transaction. It might be health. It might be family-related. It might be spending time with you know, grandkids or, or other, mm -hmm. other folks you want to spend time with. It has to be another reason other than just the money. Number two is that you, as the owner, you, you have to have some realistic expectations. Go back to what you said, you know, that $20 million that's really only worth $10 million, we got to get you real. You mm -hmm. know, it's not $20 million. It's maybe 10 it's maybe 5 it's maybe 7 it's somewhere in that range. So if you're realistic with us on what your expectations can be, we can work with you. you got to have realistic time frames. The Monday morning thing, mm -hmm. and then we get a call and says, get me out of here on Monday, can't do that. You know, this is a year process on average, some 4 months, some 12 months, but on mm -hmm. average, plan on a year. Mm -hmm. Then you got to be flexible. You know, every seller that we work with, do they want to do seller financing? No. Do they want the risk of the of the deal of the note? No. Is it part of the transactions in today's market? Yep. Mm -hmm. So those are the that's the crux of the matter. If the, if we can kind of check off that list, that those are the four things that are going to work for you, then we then we have an opportunity to to help you out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Um, <laughs> I assume that they have no choice but to, but to be realistic at some point in time, or if they're not unrealistic, then you have to walk away. We have come, that, exactly. I, I'm not adding any value, and the only thing that right. I'm doing is ruining an opportunity that may, may happen down the road over the future. Mm -hmm. If it's not going to work now for all those reasons, then let's not pretend. Let's not just sure. test the waters for the, the sake of testing the waters. If you're not committed, you don't, and it's not going to work, let's, let's make that decision now. Well, what about the circumstance where the value isn't what they want it to be, but there is a way to get there over time? Maybe it's five years. Um, I presume that, that there are certainly circumstances where they're willing to do that. Yeah. You know, I'm a baby boomer. Um, mm -hmm. My picture on the, on the first page is telling. Um, that's me. I'm a baby boomer, and 
the market I work with are the 8 million baby boomers with $10 trillion worth of, of business mm -hmm. values that uh, I think I saw a statistic that two-thirds or 75 percent have no idea how to get out of what they're in. Um, we've come through a very difficult market from 09 to 12. There was no activity. The pipeline went dry. It, it, people would realize that, yeah, my 401k went from X to X minus, maybe 40 percent of what it was, and they weren't thinking that that same thing was going to happen to their business. Mm -hmm. And when we then start introducing, oh yeah, well, what's the difference? This this business you have is a financial asset, right? It generates money for something. So it's not worth what it used to be because your revenues are down, your cash flow is down, your margins have hit the tank, and probably more important, there is no credit. And mm -hmm. you don't want to sell and hold the note at 50% of what the value was. So the message to these folks is that it's time to tee it up. You know, you have an opportunity for a little bit of a fresh start. It's disappointing that you can't do this thing in the next six to 12 months and, and make your exit, or if you can, at half the value, then you can. None of them can do that. This is too big an asset in their personal financial mm -hmm. net worth. So they sort of make an adjustment. They get past being mad and angry, realize that there's some truth to this. And then we go back and say, well, what do you need to do? So it's an opportunity to clean up your balance sheet to look at the debt, to clean up the, the, the leverage that you've taken advantage of over these years just mm -hmm. because the business would turn off so much money. Yep. So spend the next two or three years, get real with it, get it back to where it's going to make sense, and off you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of those conversations. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully they can get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's <laughs> that leads right into the next slide, believe it or not. <laughs> Not quite sure how I did that. Great segue. Um, so, how to maximize value? And this is this is a part that I have found: of the, uh, how much value is the goodwill of the owner? Um, and you know, so many of these folks don't understand that that whole concept that they built. And, and and you certainly find this a lot more nowadays with service-related businesses, where the person has built up all these relationships, and if that person walks out the door, there's not a whole lot there for the business. Um, so let's chat about that for a minute. Um, uh, you know that that could be that could be a significant piece of the business, and oftentimes a lot of these deals are predicated upon um, the uh, the owner staying in the business for a period of time from a transition standpoint. Right. Um, but what are you finding there? Is that is that a, is that a big issue in terms of again getting people educated about that? And getting them to understand that piece that oh I can't just sell for five million and go off to to Florida and play golf for the rest of my life yeah yeah um, it's another huge uh, part of the conversation that we have with them um, and to the extent the the issue of goodwill you know that the goodwill gets broken out into two different categories right we're talking about personal goodwill and we're talking about enterprise goodwill mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's enterprise goodwill just because it's Starbucks you know mm -hmm. or Dunkin' right. Donuts yeah. You know, it's a different goodwill when there's a service component to it, and everybody's used to calling Jeff mm -hmm. uh, or Ed. Um, that's very different. Valuing that, um, I, yeah. valuing that is important. Only it, it, it's a part of the process, but I think the real issue is, in, during this transition period from post close, what that role is going to be for them, even with their the the kids that we're talking about that mm -hmm. come in because they're still used to calling Jeff, not Jeff's kids. Right. Sure. Or the machine shop to get my car fixed or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So having a transition plan where the owners are part and parcel of this transition and that could be up to a couple of years mm -hmm. to make this successful. And the reason it's important to them is that in these transactions in today's market, the seller the owner is financing the deal. They don't want to finance a deal that's not going to work. Right. They want to finance something that's going to work. So they have to stay vested in the operations of the company for a period of time. And to be honest with you, most people do. I think a lot of people just want to sort of take their foot off the pedal a little bit. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go mm -hmm. away and, and fade into the sunset entirely. They just don't want to do everything that they were doing, but they'd be happy to do the things that they're good at. Yeah. 
I know, I know. In our particular business, when CPA firms are buying other CPA firms, that a lot of the uh, the value is is, is uh, based on uh, future earnings. Yeah. And, uh, um, is is that also uh, the case in a lot of other businesses where the you know if the business isn't producing, then the seller or the yeah the seller isn't really getting paid yeah as much as they thought they were going to get paid yeah so yeah. again key it's key for them to hang around yeah you know you have to peek on you sort of when you're doing these valuations you got to sort of look under the tent a little bit um, and understand what the this future cash flow is all about if we were looking um, we do a lot of work with contractors and, and trades. They've come out of a very difficult period from nine through twelve, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about the pipelines that are drying up. Drying up. They they really just went blank. They're coming back, and things are all starting to return. But if you were valuing that, what's the right value for a situation like that? Do you look at the down cycle and sort of say, "Geez, guys, you know, you, you had negative earnings for the last three years. You're not worth anything." But if you look back to you know the five years before, they had an EBITDA of a million dollars. So what do we do? You know, then you have to look at you're looking for the best proxy. Mm -hmm. The best proxy is the, the existing cash flow, if it has recurring, or is the best proxy something that's going to happen downstream with pipelines that are getting refilled, business that's coming back in, and then when you're doing a process like that and when you're doing a value or a transaction like that, you really are going to have to start introducing and talking about um, earn-out components as part of the transaction because it's, it's uncertain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'm going to speed things up a little bit here so that we, we stay on target. Um, actually, if we can go back to that last one for just a second, that's okay. But I just wanted to really briefly hit on when the process should be started, and that's really, from my perspective, a planning thing. Um, you know, every one of these businesses, in my view, would be better off if they started thinking about this five or ten years before the day they decide they really want to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know how we can convince people to do that because we have that... That, that's, that seems to be the hardest thing to do is to get people thinking about these things before they really should. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you know the old adage of if there is no pain, there's nothing I can do exactly, for you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so usually you, there's a that triggering is, event that's yeah. going to you know, force yeah. somebody to really start giving it serious thought, and it's usually not a pleasant one. No, no, I, I agree. And, and you know, if there's one thing that we can impart today, it, it is going to be about planning, which we'll talk about later on. Um, but as far as advisors, uh, Certainly, if they if they if they relied solely on on their, their their broker and their CPA, they would be fine. But what other advisors might there be involved in <laughs> in a circumstance like this? Um, there are there's a couple of important parties to this, um, and they they sort of enter at different stages of the process. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing the brokering and you're getting some trans some some traction on on a deal. The accounts, the earlier they get into this, you know, what they're focused on, what, they're, what the business owner is focusing, focusing on is, great, I'm going to sell my business for a million dollars. They have no idea what they're going to keep out of that. You know, and they don't think about that until a week before they're closing. And then they'll call and say, you realize I've got to pay 35% tax on this? Mm -hmm. And say, really? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think about that, did we? So, you know, at an early stage, we want to get the advisors, the accountants involved, so they can start doing some realistic tax planning on what this is going to net at them. Mm -hmm. It's not what you get, it's what you keep. Mm -hmm. There's a very important other advisor in this process. And if we're talking about someone who owns a company 100%, it's Jeff Inc. Uh, I know you have a spouse. Okay? Mm -hmm. You've got another silent partner there yeah. that has a very vested interest in how this process is going to work and when it's going to work. So at a point in the process, you know, for the most part, these business owners are very type A, strong-willed people. Um, and we start talking early on that, you know, we really need to sit down with you and family and figure out a little more about what you want to do and how the team is going to come together on this. Mm -hmm. So we really want the, the spouse involved in those discussions earlier rather than later. And then you've got the personal wealth guys, you know, the, the folks who are saying, okay, you're going to sell Jeff Inc., and out of that, you know, you're going to live, you know, I hate annuity tables because they tell you when you're going to die. So you're going to live another 20 years, right, and you need X number of dollars a year. And if we can monetize this asset to, to accommodate that, everybody should be happy. And, you know, you bring up a great point about the spouse and the family um, because they, they, whether, whether it's, it's a parent or not, there's a significant amount of influence going on there, whether it's at the dinner table or elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that we were talking earlier about that one company that, that sort of went through 
the whole um, transition. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. When they were selling to a third party, it turned out that the son really did not want to sign a, uh, uh, a non-compete agreement, and he decided he wanted to do that like at midnight the day before it closed. And yeah, that was contingent on the deal. Yeah, yeah. Now, I wanted to talk about um, um, who, who the most likely candidates are. We talked about the perceived value versus actual value, but you know, for, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this was because that oftentimes you're not thinking about your competitors as being the people you're going to sell your business to. Um, if, if, particularly if you're not if you're not very friendly with them, I would think. Right. Um, um, and so that's something to to seriously consider. Um, I, I know one of my clients who's who's toying with the idea at, at some point of, of selling his business uh, was telling me that uh, uh, one of his friends who's also in the business said, "When you're ready to sell, call me first. Um, I, I'd like the I'd like the first opportunity, the first crack, first look, huh?" Yeah, so you know, certainly they're out there, but oftentimes if you're in business with people and you're not getting along with them, then you're not really thinking that that person is the person that you want to sell your business to. Right. Um, and uh, you might, you might, there might be uh, businesses that are not in your geographic area that want to move into your ge geographic area. That could be certainly um, um, somebody with expansion plans or a business that wants to get into your business because it's a nice add-on to their business. Um, and then there's also the employees. Um, uh, although, uh, although I guess uh, that probably is the, the most difficult of the three, in my view. What do you think? The employees? Yeah. Yeah. For if um, if not for other reasons, it's because they don't have access to the money. Right. They're not in a position where they can do the deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's sad but true. We were um, talk about your competitors for a moment. Um, yeah, that's the old, you know, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer scenario. Mm -hmm. Not uncommon when we're working with someone who's selling their business to say, uh, one of our questions is, how do you get along with your competitors? Are they, oftentimes they're the obvious buyers. And then they'll come back and say, okay, here's how it's going to work. There are 10 people out there. You can talk to these four and you can't talk to these six. No way, no how will I sell my company to any of these six. That's usually because they stole some business, some employees, some trade secrets somewhere along the way. Yeah. I'm not going to work with that guy. His standard stinks. Okay, mm -hmm. we get mm -hmm. it. So we'll work sure. with the four that are the go-to guys. In that world of looking at competitors, one of the things we have to look to are limiting factors. So, for instance, um, you own a company and I own a company, and we do have uh, we represent different manufacturers. So you, you're very strong with your manufacturer. I'm very strong with my manufacturer. It's the same stuff, you know, but mm -hmm. it's just different manufacturers. Um, I'm a good buyer. You like me, and, and I'm interested in expanding my market and taking on more lines. However, you've got a provision in your agreement that says that you're not allowed to sell to a competing line. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand if there's some restrictions or limitations on what that competition might look like. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, do you run into people wanting to do ESOPs very often? And mine, not so much. Yeah, not so much. I, you know, I'm dealing with companies that are probably a little bit smaller than what an ESOP is going to require. Mm -hmm. um, we've certainly done some valuations for ESOPs, but yeah. I don't get involved in a lot of those those kinds of plans. Yeah. Um, now, do you have to keep going back and redoing those valuations just yeah. to get off the topic a little bit? Yeah. 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 yeah they require an annual valuation. They're they're retire they're a very sophisticated retirement plan. Right. Right. And as part of the ERISA rules, they do require an annual valuation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th those are those seem, seem to be a little bit more complex than people tend to who are selling them tend to let you know they are. <laughs> uh, at least that's been my experience. Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> the small print's important. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So um, certainly, um, you know, getting back to the family business business piece, though, um, we we touched early on uh, about how that business gets transferred to the next generation. And you know it could be through estate planning, gifting, et cetera, and oftentimes is. Um, but if, if if the person who's doing that isn't careful, what they've basically done is they've gifted away the asset that's going to that was going to kind of supply their retirement. So right. they have to also think about it in terms of, of the money that they're going to get out of it in some way, shape, or form. Cold um, hard cash. Cold hard cash. Yeah, yeah and it'll live. Um, and um, you know the best of intentions sometimes get people put in a position where um, all of a sudden they don't they don't have the wherewithal that they thought they were going to have, 
um, it's important for them to keep the family in the business, but what they didn't think about a whole lot was, okay, I'm 75 and I want to quit and, and go away. Um, what am I going to do? And is, can the business, you know, can the business afford me and my and my kid? Right. Um, so all of a sudden they they find themselves in a bind as well. Um, so there's certainly, uh, you know, the fourth the fourth one here is is uh, what we touched on earlier, which was a transaction within the family that allows the the you know business owner to kind of move on and allows the kids to be able to, to buy the business and continue the business uh, and hopefully everybody is is happy in that circumstance. So you know the the in that capacity though when you're when you're doing that transfer if it's Jeff Inc and Jeff Inc is selling to you know the, the kids who are taking over the business Aside from all the emotional things that are going on, there's a real financial thing that's happening because, you know, sort of like the key members of the company, you know, the family members don't have the ability to go out and borrow a million dollars to to pay you for your company, assuming you're selling 100%. So what happens in that scenario is you now become the bank. Right. Okay. And when you have that conversation with them, all of a sudden, there's a real straightening up in the chair, and you know, what do you mean I'm the bank? Um, well, you certainly trust your kids to run this company in a fiduciary way, so they're going to have the ability to to pay you on your note because that's a significant part of your retirement. So you're okay with that, right? And then there's usually a lot of pausing, hesitating in the room, saying, "I, I don't know." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when they become the bank instead of uh, you know just you know mom or dad. It, it's true. It's tricky. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they certainly trusted their children with other yeah. things, you know, along the way. But now all of a sudden, they're they're questioning. Uh, they're they're <laughs> what was Reagan that was trust but verify? Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so you know, when somebody is looking to sell their business, what's the best way to do it? And, and my next little question is 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 really loaded. <laughs> let's let's talk about that one first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. um, we have, we're, we're kind of spoiled. We've got some nice things that we've amassed over the last couple of years as it relates to the marketing. You know, when I started in this business, and it doesn't seem like 15 years ago was that long, but I guess it was, you know, you would go out, you would work with a company, you would get a listing, and the first thing you'd do was get it published in all the print material. You know, mm -hmm. nobody does that anymore. Right, right. <laughs> nobody does that anymore. There aren't, a, that's not a market that's, that's going to work. So when you're uh, when you're marketing a business, we have um, our internal marketing, but we have become our little company has become a worldwide you know, enterprise. Mm -hmm. And when we are marketing companies, it's not unusual for us to get calls internationally. Mm -hmm. It's very normal for us to get calls nationally. Um, so thanks to Al Gore and the internet, you know we have this access to market companies. You know, use the internet. It's robust. There are certain websites that you work with. Um, we've got a database of about 3,500 people we work with, but we really work with um, probably half the time we work with the advisors for the clients, mm -hmm. and that is probably our best market. To mm -hmm. be perfectly honest, you know, in spite of the internet and, and texting and twitting or whatever we do, um, good old-fashioned networking and sitting down and you know, doing an evening with someone is just as meaningful as it used to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. I don't think that's And brokers really... are necessary. Yeah, and, and, why, and why is that? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I say that tongue in cheek because I've had, uh, I've had attorneys that we've worked with who will give us a hard time because in the process of working with a transaction, we like to craft together a very non-binding letter of intent, and. There's a number of attorneys who say, that's just a waste of time. You know, I have no interest in it. You're wasting time. You know, I'll handle it now. <laughs> okay. Well, the brokers are necessary because they're the barrier. If, if nothing else, I'm between you and the clients that you're working with, the prospects you're working with. You can vent on me. They vent on me. My job is just to kind of keep the emotions in check. I'm constantly redirecting mm -hmm. the transactions from day one to, you know, the 365th day. So. I think that there is a real value that we, obviously, I think there's a real value that we provide. So we're good at doing the transactions, you know, to the point where we take it seriously and we're giving everybody realistic expectations and managing those expectations and managing the process. You've got a business to run. The last thing you want are 
12 people that you don't even know calling you about buying your business. Mm -hmm. It's a distraction you don't need. Yeah. A, and then B is we, we tend to work with a lot of the financing banks that are interested in helping do deals. We've right. come a little bit further than we were a year ago or two years ago. Banks are back. They're, they're a little more, they look at them a little more um, critically. Mm -hmm. But there are good banks to go to and then there's other banks. So we try not to waste time on, mm -hmm. we, try to, we, we try to be efficient with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to try and wrap up in the next couple of minutes so that um, we can um, open it up for questions. I did want to um, talk very briefly about closing up shop, and you mentioned earlier that that was something that occurred oftentimes many years ago, and, and certainly it occurs, continues to occur um, from time to time, and sometimes it is the best thing to do in, in the circumstances. You might have a business that's kind of run its course, uh, or um, you know the, the competition has become so severe that, that, that you don't see a, uh, uh, a way for that business to, to remain successful. Um, over the course of the next five or ten years, so sometimes that is the best option. Um, hopefully, they've gotten everything out of it that they yeah <laughs> yeah they could have been like uh, before yeah yeah that's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's a shame. Um, so I want to circle back though because we started this off saying what are the five uh, secrets and and you know the reality is there aren't any, there aren't five secrets but there are best practices and we've even though we haven't listed them as we've talked. We certainly have, have talked about all of these things, and, and um, the first one being plan early and often. Right. And um, you know, don't start thinking about this on that day that you decide you want to sell the business. Um, and 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 what the reason it says early and often is because you, you your plans are going to change. They're likely to change in terms of you know. Are you going to transfer the business to your children? Do they want the, the business? Do they have the ability to have the business? If they don't, what's the best way to sell the business? All that may change over a 30-year period or a 40-year period multiple times. And as the, was the case that you talked about earlier, um, when they first said they didn't want the business, or that first said that they were surprised that he did what he did, right? Um, they, they then got to the point where they didn't want the business, uh, and he thought they did. So we can also add to that plan early and often, um, and, uh, talk to um, the other principals involved on a regular basis, right. um, and that's part of the planning process. Right. Um, and remember, it's a transition, so focusing on the possibilities, because it isn't always simply about transferring the family business from one generation to the next. That's not always the smartest thing to do. It might well be the, the best thing to do for the family is to sell the business and then have the family, the family has these other, this cash now to use to right. do other things. Right. Um, and again, there's lots of reasons for that. We can go back to ability and desire. We can go back to marketability and talk about that. But um, it's a, it is a transition. And the other thing about that is, is, you know, you're transitioning out of the business and into a, a new stage of life, right? Um, and that's always uh, has its challenges, right? Um, there's in the meantime, a, you'll have the corner office and the back of the shop that yeah. you can come into every uh -huh. once in a while if you want to. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but there's a there's a great book out there um, called um, Immunity to Change, and it's not. And I, I'm not necessarily suggesting people read the book, but I'm suggesting that they think about why somebody wrote a book called Immunity to Change, and it's because so many of us can't change, and this is a transition, and you have to focus on that piece of it, too. So I would imagine that one of the conversations you're having with the guy who's selling the business is, what is it you're going to do afterwards? What is it, you know, in terms of what is it you want to accomplish, what is it you're going to do afterwards? Are you going to be comfortable? What's going to happen? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Fair statement? Uh, very fair, and unless they have a boat, they don't know. Yeah. If they have a boat, they know they're going to be, you know, tooling the Chesapeake on the weekends instead of, you know, working in the shop, but yeah. by and large, they really don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and certainly focus on maximizing value. Um, the first part of that is the be realistic part, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Oftentimes, they're not realistic initially. They have to be brought into a, a, a reality. Um, and then they have to think about what is it that they want to do, how far do they want to go, how much do they want to work on maximizing the value, um, and how does that fit in with their current plans? And obviously, if they're, if they're, if they're coming to you at the, the last day, that's too late for them to do that, really. Yep. Um, so again, that goes back to the, to the plan early and often. Um, so 
you know, if you're thinking about it, you need to be thinking about, you know, maximizing the value when you're not planning on selling the business for 20 years, perhaps, but you still need to have that in the back of your mind somewhere. Yeah. That the ultimate, the ultimate goal is going to be that the business will be transferred to somebody unless you close up shop. <laughs> At some point in time, it will yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. Um, so seek advice and counsel is another, is another best practice. Um, and it's not just the business broker, even though I have that up there, but it's, it's talking to all your advisors, yep. um, whether they be your attorney, your financial people, your CPA. Um, and in the case of family businesses, you may have somebody who you're using as, um, you know, your family business advisor who is, is guiding you through the whole process of dealing with the family and the family business. All of those people are really, really important, um, and they're going to help you make the best decision. And that gets back to you're going to talk to those people as you plan early and often, which is number five as well. Um, uh, I don't think I can emphasize the planning piece um, enough. Um, so, so we've talked uh, for almost an hour, um, uh, and we probably ought to, ought to stop and see if there's any, any, any questions that we can answer. Um, we do have one logistical question, which is whether the webinar will be available for viewing later. And yes, um, the vi a video of the webinar will be posted on our website, bbcpa.com slash webinar. Once it's live as an attendee of the webinar, you'll also get a notification about that. So it will be available later. And we do have, you know, I know we're trying to wrap up here, so one quick question we'll take. Um, and then I do believe you touched on this a bit, but, you know, can you talk a little bit more if there's anything else you want to cover about what's currently going on in the market about selling privately held businesses? Is there anything there you want to touch on? Sure. Um, we, we did talk a little bit about that. We, we mentioned that in um, recent years, trying to work through years 2009 through 2012, if you had a privately owned company and you were looking to, to sell it, it was not a good time to do that. It was a bad time to do that. So at this point, um, our pipeline is, is filling up. We do have buyers who are coming back, and we do have sellers, actually, who have gotten a little more realistic in terms of what they really can realize for the value of their company. So, um, and probably more importantly, you know, there, there's a slew of banks who are coming back and taking even their critical look. They're taking a look, and they are doing deals. So getting better, warming up, starting to bubble, just not percolating you know, at 100% yet. Okay. Good. Well, I know in the interest of time and also in the second half of the World Cup game, I think we're going to wrap up now. Thank you again for participating. We hope it's been an insightful webinar. Here's a quick evaluation survey once the webinar ends. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact us. Thanks again for attending, and have a great day.